Do you start with sharing a little bit of your testimony? And I'm going to turn the program over to you now. And okay. then we'll take questions at the end. So here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, go ahead. This is, yeah. here you go, everybody. Ready? Welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to uh, share this program with you. Sorry, I couldn't be there. Normally, we go to California this time of year. We have there two uh, sons and their families down there, and we awesome. spent some time. Unfortunately, things were closed up a bit in uh, Southern California, so we had to change plans, and uh, here we are in a Zoom meeting. Um, I, I run a, an apologetics forum uh, group up here in Washington State, and uh, you know, much like Bill and uh, uh, Jim Pamphlin do down in California there. Um, just a little bit of background myself. I've been, uh, uh, I'm retired now. Um, my life's a little complicated. I was uh, born in uh, the Netherlands. Um, my parents decided to emigrate to Canada shortly after the war. So of course I came with them and I, I got all my education in Canada in, uh, uh, physics and uh, my graduate degree is in nuclear physics. So I'm basically a scientist by training. Um, my first full time job actually was with uh, Bell Telephone Labs in New Jersey. And so I was fortunate enough to uh, spend time there working with the scientists, and I was involved in the uh, uh, Unix software activity. And then after 10 years there, I went to actually to California, to Santa Monica with a, uh, a startup company. And so I've been involved in the high tech industry for all of my career. Uh, the last 20 years I spent as uh, running my own uh, internet consultancy. And uh, now I've basically retired. I've, I spent a lot of time uh, developing lectures and courses on um, apologetics, creation versus evolution being the main thing. And uh, I've given lectures um, uh, here in the US, Canada, and overseas. My wife and I often go overseas to uh, uh, teach at uh, um, seminaries there, teach courses on apologetics. And, um, but uh, now uh, we don't go there that often. So that, that's my background. Um, I grew up in a very um, uh, devout family, and um, I'm one of uh, 10 children, five born in Holland and five born in, in um, Canada. And uh, we have five children as well, half of them born in Canada and the other half in the US. So uh, this is our third country. Uh, and I enjoy the freedom that we have here. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a secular university, and of course, I was challenged there uh, by the geology professor saying, forget what you were taught at church and in the Bible. Look at, look at these layers. This is how things really happen. It took a long time for all these layers to form. And uh, uh, so that, that was my first challenge to my faith. Um, I didn't let it bother me. And um, as I grew older and, and as our children grew older, I got involved in teaching them uh, the Bible and, and science. And uh, I've maintained, maintained my faith and my belief in young earth creationism. And I have the privilege of speaking on that topic um, at many different places. And the, the lecture that we have here, I've labeled it uh, information, the basis for life. Uh, I like to say that the only difference between living things and dead things is information. And uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Now, the, I, I made up a sheet, and the bill probably has uh, circulated that with the uh, fill-ins. And um, uh, as I flip through these slides, you'll see the words for the fill-ins come out. Now, what I'm going to cover in this next slide here is these 10 topics. And um, uh, first of all, what is our view of life from a, from a biblical point of view and from a um, evolution point of view? Uh, I'm gonna define some terms and then I'm gonna talk about the nature of information, the nature of machines and the nature of programs because uh, we see 
in the computer world, of course, if we have information, we have machines, we have programs, and how do we relate that to living uh, organisms? Um, so rather than just reading all that, let me just uh, jump right into it. The views of life. The biblical view of life uh, is given to us actually in the first, first chapter of Genesis. Um, you'll see that the word kind is used 10 times. Everything God created according to its kind and kinds reproduced according to their kinds. So he says that 10 times for all um, uh, you know, concepts of life. So I think he means it. And uh, so that's our basis for the biblical view of life. Now, if you look at the evolution view, uh, and I'm sure the children have been taught this in school, um, you know, the basic concept that everything is related to common ancestry. In other words, they, they would say we evolved from the, from the previous more primitive form of life. And all life came about that way. And so then the question is, well, where does first life come? You know, there has to be a first life in order to get this diversity of life. So evolutionists would say, well, everything rose through mutations and natural selection and through random chance processes. You know, molecules in the early days of the earth somehow got together and formed a more complex molecule and DNA, RNA, and that formed the base of life. And uh, nobody knows no scientist has come up with an idea how that might have happened. They just assumed it happened. And at the bottom there, you'll see that uh, uh, the figure, you can see my mouse moving on the story of evolution, origin of the universe, the earth, the primordial soup, RNA, DNA, primitive animals, fish, reptiles, mammals, lower primates, and all the way up to us as the most complex life. So that's the view of people who believe in evolution, uh, very different from uh, the biblical view uh, as explained in the book of Genesis particularly. So another concept that I want to introduce because it'll come up later in our talk, uh, everything that we see came about by three different means. Either came here, just random chance, I mean, the sand on the seashore, where, where are those grains of sand? How did they get there? And why are they in certain arrangements? Well, that's just chance. The second thing uh, that can explain how things came to be is the laws of nature. And uh, I like to use the example of the uh, law of gravity. If you step on a, a table and put your foot, one foot over the end, which way are you going? Up? Or down. I think you'll agree that we always go down. That's a law of nature which is true and cannot be argued. And if, if it can't be explained by that, well then it must be designed. And um, if you look at uh, these faces on Mount Rushmore, there, or Rushmore um, you'll recognize the faces of some past presidents. <clears throat> How did those faces get on there? Did the rain fall on the rock in such a way that it carved out those faces exactly the way we see them? Uh, that would be random chance. Or it could possibly be a law of nature. If you got the, the rain falling on this rock in a certain size uh, of raindrops, it would carve out these faces. Well, I think you'll agree that neither of those explain how those faces got there. The faces got there because somebody designed them, you know, the faces according to how these men look, and then some somebody else carved those faces out, and that's what we call design. Um, and th and that requires an intelligence. All design that we see requires intelligence. It requires an intelligent agent. Okay, in this case, it's the the person that. Uh, uh, mark these 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 vases out, and then there's a craftsman who just carved them out. That requires an intelligent mind to do that. Nobody can, you know, and you can't send an animal out there and have them carve out these vases. There's intelligence involved in that. 
Now, the, the basis for life, of course, living uh, beings is the cell, uh, the living cell. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into explaining what all these are, but basically the, these are the, the major components of uh, a living cell. You can see the cell here, and you don't have to read all those words, but you can see there is a nucleus involved there. Um, there is uh, uh, ribosomes, there is, uh, um, let's see, uh, chromosomes and, and, all, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And also there's a, a, a membrane which holds it all together. All very complex. And so you have proteins, which are chains of amino acids, you have DNA, you have RNA, you have ways of, of a transcription from RNA to DNA, and uh, that's needed to build proteins. You have catalysts for, for this, you have replication of the cells. I mean, there must be a way to duplicate the cell and uh, that's built into the cell. But now you, have, you, uh, you need a protein to build a cell. But where, so where does the protein come from? Well, it requires a cell. Where does the cell come from? It requires protein. So you have what we often call a chicken and egg problem. Which one came first, the chicken or the egg? And there's no different here. You cannot explain that, that the cell happened through some natural random processes. <clears throat> here are some examples. Uh, if you look at the, starting at the top left, you've got the cave wall and there's some scratches. You can see on the rock face, there's some scratches. How did they happen? Well, you could say, well, little rocks came down and, and from the ceiling and carved up those, those lines you see. Well, in some cases that might be explained. But then if you look at the one below, you'll see uh, certain animals carved in the horses and cows and boars, how did they get there? Was that by random chance? Is that some law of nature that explains how that'll happen? No, that required design. That required an intelligent human being to carve those uh, animals on that face wall. So th then you come to the human genome and the human genome consists of uh, three billion base pairs. Uh, I, and I'll get to what a base pair means in a, uh, further on, but three billion of those. And we have in our, in our bodies, 75 trillion cells. Yeah, and, and we have different kinds of cells, obviously about 200 different kinds of cells. You know, we get hair cells, fingernail cells, um, eye cells, ear cells, mouth cells, 200 uh, different kinds. Um, and it's all made up by these 75 trillion cells. Very, very complicated. Did that happen by chance? Well, if this can't happen by chance, the painting on the wall, how could something orders of magnitude more complex happen by random chance? So evolutionists see this too, but what do they say? Uh, here's a few examples, and uh, I use uh, um, Richard Dawkins, who, who's a well-known um, British atheist and biologist. He, say, he says, biology is a study of complicated things that have been the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. They appear, the bodies appear to have been designed for a purpose. Well, who designed it? He doesn't, he can't answer that. Uh, they believe that mutations and natural selection would be that nature did that. So, and here's admissions from two others. Uh, Dr. Todd from Kansas State says, even if all the data points to intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. In other words, they, they just dismiss it out of, because they, they, they can't consider that there's an intelligent designer. They, they don't consider that God exists. And Francis Crick says, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. They just can't admit it. 
but the evidence is so obvious as we will see. So now we let me get into um, some definitions and I'll try, try to make this as simple as possible. Uh, evolution. Evolutionists believe that everything can be explained in terms of two entities, mass and energy. And we know from Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy and mass can be converted one into the other. And, and we agree, that's a good sign. But where do we get information from? You know, can information form through random processes? We would say no. We, we have nothing in our experience that could show that information can come from random natural processes. So we'll see that life consists of uh, three things. Um, <clears throat> mass and energy. You know, that's obvious. We have mass, we have energy. But there's a third thing, and that is information. And that information is encoded in the cell. And, and remember that mass and energy, that is material. You know, we can see that, we can feel it, uh, but information is non-material. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more when we look at uh, computers and uh, uh, human cells. So the other thing that uh, I'm gonna use, what do we mean by information? Well, there's four parts of information and this is, uh, you can fill it on your sheet here too. Uh, code, a code, I'll explain, a meaning, um, an action, and a purpose. Those four things. And let, let's, I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Here, the nature of information. If I, if I took a bottle of ink and uh, somehow it spilled on a piece of paper, would you expect to see any useful information that you could read there? Uh, I don't think so. It's no, just, just, just a mess. You know, it doesn't mean anything there. Now, we have a uh, code um, that we deal with in the English language. So you, code, in this case, is the letters of the alphabet from A to Z. And uh, for older people that, that can still read the script language, you, know, you, you can almost read those words here in the script. But if you look at, the, you know, here's the message written in the sand, and you can clearly read that as, you know, the word write, which is consists of five letters, the word in consists of two letters, and then sand, which consists of four letters. Does that, um, that consists of code, the well, letters from the alphabet, it consists of words, uh, which have, have meaning, and, uh, it consists of uh, some action and a purpose. How do the letters get in the sand there on the seashore? Did the, did the waves wash up in such a way that it left these letters? I don't think I convinced you of that. I think it's clearly somebody wrote in the sand with a finger or a spoon or whatever. So that's, that's information. Um, and definitions, and I'm going to skip over this quickly, but see th these four things, code, in, the, in terms of the English language, we have an alphabet. In terms of the, uh, um, our cells, we have DNA. That's the information in the DNA. We have meaning. So in the case of the uh, English language, we have words that make sense. And then in, the in uh, life itself, we, we have codons. And then we have expected action, um, which is a, a sentence. And then we have a purpose. The, the sentence, uh, sentences have some purpose. So we're, we're left with, this is the formal definition of information. Um, it's encoded symbolically, uh, represented message conveying expected action and intended purpose. If I look at a sentence, it has a purpose. It has, it, it has a verb in that that gives it action. So that, that's the definition that we're using. So now let's apply that to writing. So if I wanna write something, we need letters, words, and sentences. 
So I can use letters from the alphabet. I can use numbers and I can turn them into words. And they're with a, a verb in that sentence uh, that uh, denotes action. And there's a purpose for that sentence, those four things. So I'm going to look at two different sentences here. <clears throat> First of all, here, here we have some letters. Well, I recognize the letters as part of the English alphabet, of the Roman alphabet. Uh, and if, can anybody read that word? Is there any, is, it, is that German, is that Dutch, is that Russian? No, there, there is no language that I know, and probably none in the room, you know what language that is written in. So it is complex. Okay, the, the letters are complex. They're, they're put down there for purpose, but there's no meaning to them. It's unspecified complexity. But if you look at this down below, we have a sentence with a subject, the cow jumped at the verb over the moon. Do you understand what that sentence says? Yeah, that makes sense. So it has, you know, code, uh, the letters. It has meaning, in other words, words. You know, cow, I know what that word means. Uh, if I put that, spelled it C-W-O, I have no idea what that means. So this word, these words have meanings. And then the action, you know, in the verb, there's a verb that indicates action. And there is a purpose. The cow jumped over the moon. This is something you tell your little kids before they understand that doesn't work. But anyway, it's a meaningful sentence. So now we come to information in computers. Where is information stored in computers? It's stored on a disk. Um, you know, either a solid state disk or a rotating disk. You know, someplace where you have zeros and ones. Um, but how do I, if I look at these zeros and ones, how do I make any sense of that? I don't know what that means. So what, what you, the programmer, what he does, he writes um, in terms of pseudocode, different languages, you know, Fortran language, or the uh, basic language, the C language, and uh, different scripts. And, and I can sort of see what these, these words, these instructions do. And then you use a compiler to turn these into bits and zero and one. And then the program, you can run the program. So this is what we call pseudocode. Um, but I think you know, programmers can understand what that's doing. But now let's look at these bits again, zeros and ones. Um, I asked the question, does information have any weight? If I turn all these ones into zeros, will that disk weigh less, more? No, no difference. In other words, information has no weight to it at all. I mean, the, the information I showed you in the sentence there, uh, those are words you can understand, but if I had different words, you know, there'd be no difference in the weight of that information. There is no weight to information, but it clearly, to write these programs, you need a programmer, okay? You need an, an intelligent agent. I mean, these programs are not gonna just happen by random chance. I mean, you know, in, in a, an operating system like Windows, if you change one bit in the operating system, the program will probably crash, it doesn't run. It's gotta be very, very specific. So here is, uh, and then we come to uh, living systems. That's where we get into DNA. DNA is the molecule of life. And I said, there are trillions of cells in our body. And these cells here. There are, we have 60, 46 human chromosomes um, and 3 billion base pairs. These, these are the base pairs, A and T, um, uh, go together and C and G go together. These are base pairs. We have 3 billion of those in our bodies. That's a huge number. And we have 30 different, 30,000 different genes in our body. Did all of these just happen by chance or is there a design for that? I think there's a design. This is way, way too 
complex. Okay, then what about machines? Um, you'll see an assembly line of cars here in the top left. Um, now you can imagine, well, maybe those cars are, are um, they're designed by some human being, but you put them in the assembly line and they just get made. No, the intelligence involved that. First of all, you had to, you had to build the assembly line to manufacture the, the uh, car factory as well. And so this requires an intelligent agent. And then we look at motors, and the motor of a car. Uh, that's another very, very complex entity. Did that happen? Can that happen by chance? All this, these metal pieces just uh, get introduced and, and they just fall into place and roll off the motor works. Now, I think you will agree it's, it's called an intelligent designer to design it, first of all, and then some other technicians to put that together. And so you're here, you have rotary motors, uh, you have integrated circuits and, uh, you know, and, and CPUs and, and storage units, all that make up a computer. All of those require an intelligent designer. Nothing happens by chance. Okay, so th those are machines. You, you can deal with those. Well, there happen to be machines in your body. Now, you, fortunately, you can't feel the, those machines moving, but here is an example uh, of a, a machine that actually looks like a rotator, and they do rotate. In fact, they can go at like 10,000 cycles per second. You don't feel them, but they're moving in your cells, and they can stop on a dime, so to speak. They can turn, change direction. You're not going to feel that. But these are actual machines that fit in your body. And these machines wouldn't work unless all the parts are there, just like the machines that I showed you in the previous slide. All the parts of the car, they, they've got to be there. You know, you can have a wheel, but if you don't put the tire on there, it doesn't work. All the parts need to be there. And that's a very important concept. Uh, it's called um, irreducible complexity. What that means is that all the parts need to be there for something to work. And the simplest thing to look, look at is like the uh, mousetrap, okay? You, you have a, a base, uh, you have a, uh, a hammer, you have a holding bar, a spring, and a catch there to hold that. If I took one of those parts off of there, would the mouse trap catch any mice? No. None. All five parts need to be there. That's a concept we call irreducible complexity. And uh, Behe, the scientist, is um, credited with coming up with that term. Irreducible complexity. All parts functional must be working. All five parts. Mousetrap, very simple, just five parts. But do you think a mousetrap is going to appear without somebody designing that? and putting that together? No, even a mousetrap requires an intelligent designer. So Did you know that germs in your intestines have sophisticated machines inside of them? Like all living things, E. coli bacteria contain DNA, which requires sophisticated machinery to read the DNA and turn the information into proteins, which are the major components of all living things. One of the key machines involved is the ribosome. According to the world's leading science journal, Nature, the ribosome, together with its accessories, is probably the most sophisticated machine ever made. All of its components are active and moving, and it is environmentally friendly. Friendly. Ribosomes, however, are not just stunning examples of nanotechnology. They also seriously undermine the idea that life arose spontaneously. Life is not possible without ribosomes. So if a hypothetical first living cell arose spontaneously, this means ribosomes must have arisen spontaneously also. Call me a skeptic if you like, but the idea that sophisticated machines can arise without a designer sounds like a fairy tale. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, there is a machine that exists in your body and there are thousands of them. Um, I think it's a few hundred in each cell. You think those could happen by chance? No, somebody had to design that. 
Okay, so that's information. Uh, that's machines. Now let's talk about programs. Okay, if you're a software engineer, you know uh, you, you could write uh, programs in, in various different languages like Fortran, Basic, C, uh, Java. And you know that the computers are comprised of hardware at the core, you know, the CPU, disk, mouse, et cetera, system software, and that we call that the operating system. And then there's very different application programs that run on top of that. So very, very sophisticated, very complex. And here, you know, just an example of a, turns out this is a, a Java program, okay? So again, those programs, you can run them as applications uh, on the system software. So it can run on Windows, it can run on Apple computers, what have you. So that's a computer program. Do you think it, that happened by chance? No, an intelligent program needed to write that. Okay, and that, then we look at, well, what about the cell, the human cell? Well, remember I, we talked about the ribosome, which is one of the uh, machines. We talked about it, there has to be replication, reproduction of cells. And that comes about uh, through um, um, DNA and the transcription process and a messenger RNA, and then it, it produces a protein. So all those things required to build a protein. And of course, cells have proteins. So how do you get the cell? It's that old chicken and egg effect again. And so again, I'm not gonna go through all these steps here, but the point is it's very complex and it's a chicken and egg kind of a problem. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, who understands programs, of course, and, and he says, the human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. So he admits that the complexity of the programs in our body are orders of magnitude more complex than the Windows operating system that his company wrote. And remember, uh, the, the uh, operating system in a computer, um, if you take one bit out of place there, it'll fail. We actually, we have redundancy in our bodies. We have two hands, we have two ears, two eyes. And, uh, and God gave us one mouth because he, he wants us to hear more than we talk. So again, our body is designed uh, with intention. So then um, summarizing your know, life. Life requires information. I explained the information that's required, the DNA. It, re it requires complexity. Okay, the DNA is consisted of the um, base pairs of A, T, and C, G. The, the codons, which consist of these base pairs, and it can, life consists of 20 left-handed amino acids. There are thousands of different kinds of amino acids, uh, but the only ones that comprise life are the 20 specific left-handed amino acids. Right-handed amino acids are not part of our body. So biological systems exhibit a specified complexity. Okay, I can put letters together and uh, into a word, but it has to be a very specific order. And it, it uh, also requires irreducible complexity. In other words, all the parts need to be there for the body to work. All the parts that you see in that picture of the cell, they all need to be there and function for the cell to work. And uh, natural mechanisms or undirected causes cannot be used to explain the origin of complexity. I mean, complexity is not gonna come about by random processes. It requires intelligent design. Intelligent design is the best explanation for the origin of specified complexity and irreducible complexity that we see in our living body. So a little bit more on information. I'm not gonna spend time on this. We, we, again, we have the code, which is the alphabet, um, but in the case of, the, of life, it's the DNA pairs, the base pairs, the A and and uh, T and C and G. 
And then we have those pairs put together, those three letter words represent one of the of the 20 left-handed amino acids that make up life. And the sequence of codons in the DNA represents a sequence of amino acids in a protein. And the action is the proteins are needed for construction, function, maintenance, re reproduction of the living cell. And the purpose of all that, the purpose of all these is reproduction of life. You need all of this, all that complexity. And here again is a, uh, an expanded picture of the, uh, uh, of the cell. I'm sure you've seen this in some of your biology books. Very, very complex. So do we have any evidence for design life? Yes. Biology, the presence of complex and functionally innovative machines cast doubt on the Darwinian mechanisms of self-assemblies. Yeah, we see all the complexity. Um, there's no way that those, those complex machines the complex code could come together by random chance crossing. We see in the molecular biology, the presence of inflammation encoded in the DNA. Um, and here's just another picture of that. Here's a uh, Lewontin, who's a Harvard biologist. Uh, he's not a believer. He's, he urges scientists to embrace a materialism that is absolute only believe in materialism, only believe in matter and energy, and to stick with material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive. There's no way they can explain it, but they stick to it because they don't accept God. We've shown that DNA is actually the software of life. It's totally interchangeable between the digital world and the biological world. The DNA code itself is so digital, is so almost exactly like uh, a computer tape. Totally interchangeable. The DNA code itself is the software of life. It's so digital. Scientists have come to the amazing conclusion that our bodies contain digital code. digital code. In fact, Bill Gates, you know, the founder of Microsoft, tweeted, DNA is more advanced than any software ever created. Ever created. Think about it. A program or code is written by someone very smart. The more complex the code, the more intelligent the author has to be. So here's the question. If our DNA code is more complex than any man-made software, where did it come from? Is it possible it was authored without an author, author without programmed, an author. Without programmed without a program? Programmed without a program. Materialists think so through neo-Darwinism, the modern version of Darwinian evolution. Stephen Meyer, author of the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt, explains. According to neo-Darwinism, new genetic information arises as a result of random mutations in the arrangement of the nucleotide bases along the spine of the DNA molecule. If those Okay, so they're, they're just uh, putting it all together in that short video clip. There's no way that uh, information can be formed by random chance crossing. It just doesn't work. And uh, here, here's a way to think of it. Uh, you know, you, you talk about flipping a coin, you know, the heads uh, or tail. And if you flip them often enough, mostly you're going to have 50% heads or 50% tail. What's the chance of getting uh, just one head with uh, two toes, um, it's half. Uh, what about if I try to get three heads in a row? Well, if I throw it, uh, um, you know, eight times, I'll get, uh, you know, one eighth. Uh, ten heads in a row. Well, I'll probably have to, to, to uh, do it uh, uh, two, two to the tenth two to the 10th here, which is uh, in uh, terms of the uh, decimal system is, is 1024, or you can think of it as 10 to the power of three. 100 heads in a row, well, well that'll take you 10 to the power of 30 throws to get 100 in a, in a row. And then more impossible, 1,000 heads in a row, one in 10 to the power of 200. It's just not gonna happen by chance. 
And so that's what we deal with when we look at the complexity of the cell, the complexity of life. Uh, there's a law, mathematical law of probability uh, that anything less than one and 10 to the power of 50 is mathematically impossible. So these things here, you know, th those are impossible. The, this one here is impossible, just not gonna happen. Okay, so that little bit about probability. Uh, here, here's some crazy things. What's the probability of an explosion in junkyard creating a car? I Meaning you go to a car junkyard, and you got all the parts of the cars, you know, a whole bunch of cars, and now you have an explosion. What's the probability of forming a running car? Zero. It ain't going to happen. What about creating a Boeing airplane that can fly? Well, Boeing airplanes consist of 5 million parts, and all of those parts don't fly. What's the chance of an explosion in a large junkyard forming an airplane? You're not going to convince anybody about that. So it's going to take an intelligent agent to put to come up with the design, first of all, and then put it all together. Then we look in terms of life, what's the probability of a protein coming into being by chance? Well, here's uh, the parts of a protein. Proteins consist of amino acids. I said there, there are a few thousand different types. Um, half of them are, are right-handed and the other half are left-handed. Well, the building blocks of life, the proteins, um, require a large organic molecule which contain hundreds to even a few thousand amino acids in a certain sequence. There's specified long sequences of amino acids. Um, so, and it contains 20 different left-handed amino acids. What, if you form a protein with all the right amino acids in a row and you removed one of them or added one, would that protein still work? No, it wouldn't. It required a very specific order. So you can take one away or, or, or add one and it just, it'll be useless if you try to remove a piece from that. So um, let me skip this one here. How safe, simple can life be? Remember I told you that the human genome, you know, we, can ha we have up to 3 billion DNA base pairs. The smallest bacteria has 580,000 DNA base pairs. Pretty complex. What is the chance that you could um, get all the right parts and by chance you would form a small bacteria? The probability is zero. It just is not going to happen. So if that can happen, what about human genome? It's not going to happen. It cannot happen by chance. So if you look at the, the put it in context, um, one single protein of 400 amino acids in a specific order, what's the probability of getting that? That's one in 10 to the power of 240. What about a single cell, this here? That's one in 10 to the power of 40,000 for a spontaneous formation of life. There are only 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the whole universe. And then we come against this law of uh, mathematical probability. Anything less than one in 10 to the 50th is impossible mathematically. And see, all of these numbers here are larger than 50. It isn't going to happen. Cannot be explained by mathematical probability. Uh, here's how uh, um, an evolutionist, Paul Davies from uh, Australia, here's what he would say. Uh, he would say, it's a shame that there are precious few hard facts when it comes to the origin of life. We have a rough idea when it began on Earth, some interesting theories about where, but the how part has everybody stumped. Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. 
evolutionist. He admits we have we have no clue how it could happen, but we just won't accept an intelligent agent. Here's a German information scientist, and he's a creationist. He says there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself, itself in matter. It just can't happen. Here's a, a, an expert in information theory. So then we have in conclusion, now remember, life consists of material and energy, which is something we can see and feel, and it's material and information, which we cannot see, and it, it's non-material. Life requires this information. It requires machines, as we saw. It requires programs in the DNA. It requires complexity, both irreducible complexity, which is all the parts, and specified complexity because the in the, in the case of a, a uh, word, you know, all the letters have to be in a very specified order to make that meaning. And that requires a design, life requires design, and design requires a designer. So life from non-life, not a chance. Ain't gonna happen, no way. Information is the basis for life. Information requires an intelligent design. And that's summarized in these two points here. Information is the basis for life. And I believe that's the last uh, point in your, um, uh, your fill-in slides there. Information requires an intelligent mind. So th that's uh, the conclusion we draw from this. And it's very important because uh, this is one of the key arguments against evolution. You know, this requires, life requires a design that pure and simple. There's no way around it. Um, so I'm, I've recorded this lecture and I intend to put it up on my uh, YouTube uh, channel and I'll, I'll give um, uh, Bill and Jennifer a, a, a link to that when we have that completed. So if we have some questions, I guess we can, uh, we can uh, take a few now. Let's see. Okay. So if we have questions out there, we can. Uh... I have a question in the audience here. Okay. Okay, so Heinz, the question is in the in the uh, slide presentation, you said there were 400 amino acids and he had a question about, he had heard that there were 20 um, amino acids. That, yeah, there, there are, to, to explain, there are thousands of different kinds of amino acids and, uh, and, and some are left-handed and some are right-handed. The uh, life only, uses 20 left-handed amino acids. And then if you, if, you, if you remember the, um, uh, for those who went to school recently, the Miller experiment, where Miller claims to have formed some components of life, the amino acids in this experiment, well, what he produced was 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed. And they're not the right, right left-handed amino's to make life. And, and you can't mix left and right for life. It's only left-handed. I clarify? Kind of. Yeah. And, and just, to, just to add to that, I think he was referring to the 400 um, amino acids in a sequence for a uh, protein. Well, that's just that's just an example. You know, there are proteins with more amino acids, and there are proteins with less, but they're all in a very specific order.
I believe so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me just check. Okay. Hey, question, Heinz, uh, or if anybody else has the answer to this one. The question is how many proteins, different kinds of proteins, are in our body? I, I believe it's it's in the tens of thousands. I, I, I can't, I don't remember the exact number, but it's in the tens of thousands. I'm not sure. I think, yeah, my thought too, are they still looking and discovering like there's, you know, kind of, there's more to it than we know, right? The enzymes that they're doing. Anything else? Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Phil has a question, hang on. Bill's, uh, he just had a question that came to him about the number of atoms in the universe, if they are constant or if they're increasing and decreasing or fluctuating. I, I believe, well, uh, I don't know. We, we can't measure, th this is an estimate, estimate a number, you know, 10 to the power of 80, which is a huge number. And uh, I don't think we can be more specific than that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Can we close out the Zoom part now? Thank you. Thank you, Heinz. Appreciate all this. We really enjoyed your presentation. I'm doing a applause here and ladies and gentlemen for joining us on Zoom. Um, and, and I'm gonna... let, yeah, let, let me just add that the sure. uh, you see at the bottom of the slide. I think your slide is still up there. Yes, you can yeah. still so if, you if you have any questions, you're free to email me at that email address on the slide. And also, um, my website, my main website is just myname.com. And then all of my messages, this being one of them, you can find you know, here under messages uh, on my website. Excellent. So there, there are, there are hundred, hundreds of different messages out there. And um, messages going back, um, uh, well, at least 12 years. You know, a lot of them from my lectures over in Europe as well, and uh, courses uh, as well. Uh, we're gonna, we'll do some, yeah, unless, let me see if, um, yeah, I didn't get that one either, so let me ask. Heinz, can I ask you a specific question from the paper? Sure. Uh, number 11 asked how many cells are in your body? Yeah, it's a the number it, it, that I use is 75 trillion. Okay. Yeah, but I, I've, I've seen different numbers and from ranging from 60 to 100 trillion. 60 to 100, okay, wow. Yeah, great. large okay. number. <laughs> wow. Well, Thank you, Heinz, so much for your yeah. talk. We appreciate it. And thank you for your patience and technology. Those of you who are on Zoom and participating, we're going to close out the Zoom meeting and then wrap up um, from here. So thank you so much, Heinz. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. For coming yeah, you're done. welcome. Did, did thank you, you very much. Did thank you, you guys. Thank you. you. And I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Um,